Pancreatic carcinoma describes the pancreas having cancerous cells arise. Now, a healthy pancreas has two types of glands. Exocrine glands, which send digestive enzymes off to the small intestine, and endocrine glands, which help regulate metabolism in the body, for example, maintaining normal blood sugar. Over 95% of pancreatic tumors develop in the pancreas's exocrine tissues. And of these, tumors arising in the epithelial cells lining the pancreatic ducts account for the vast majority of cases. This type of pancreatic cancer is known as pancreatic adenocarcinoma due to the cell's glandular-like appearance under the microscope. Often, pancreatic adenocarcinoma is used interchangeably with pancreatic carcinoma. These tumors typically form in the head or the neck of the pancreas, but in some cases, tumors form in the tail. Around 5% of exocrine pancreatic carcinomas are caused by malignancies in the acinar cells, which are the cells that produce digestive enzymes like trypsinogen, and around 1% are cyst adenocarcinomas, or malignant cysts. There are also other types of pancreatic cancer, but those are even more rare. Generally, pancreatic carcinomas caused by genetic mutations in the ductal epithelial cells. And these mutations might activate oncogenes, which promote cancer, or inactivate tumor suppressor genes. Either way, this can lead to uncontrolled cell growth, caused by the disruption of the cell signaling pathways that regulate cell survival and growth as well as multiple immune system responses, like inflammation and stress responses. Although it's not exactly clear how these genetic mutations that trigger pancreatic carcinoma develop, there are some well-known modifiable risk factors, like smoking, which increases the risk by two to five-fold, obesity, as well as eating a diet high in red meat. There are also some non-modifiable risk factors, like being male, being African-American, and being over 65 years old. Also, certain other diseases seem to increase the risk of developing pancreatic carcinoma, like diabetes, chronic pancreatitis, and liver cirrhosis, all of which are linked to excessive alcohol consumption. So there does seem to be an indirect relationship between pancreatic carcinoma and alcohol as well. Finally, a family history of pancreatic cancer is also an important risk factor with inherited mutations like BRCA2, or breast cancer gene 2, being the most common cause of inherited pancreatic carcinoma, with mutations in PALB2 taking second place. Initially, symptoms are often vague, like nausea, vomiting, and fatigue. There might also be weight loss, which might be due to cancer-associated anorexia, or malabsorption due to an obstructed pancreatic duct, which can cause steatorrhea, or foul-smelling, greasy, loose stools. One of the most specific symptoms of pancreatic carcinoma is mid-epigastric pain that radiates to the mid or lower back, which often hurts the most at night when the individual is lying down flat. Another classic symptom that's been described is called the trousseau sign of malignancy, which is when blood clots that can be felt as small lumps under the skin appear unexpectedly in superficial veins, and then over time migrate to different locations, as well as Corvoiser's sign which is when the gallbladder is enlarged and palpable, and the patient doesn't find it at all tender to the touch, which is unlike gallstones. The location of the tumor can affect the symptoms as well. For example, if the tumor is in the head of the pancreas, then it can block the common bile duct, which leads to a backup of bile and causes obstructive jaundice. Individuals with this might have a loss of appetite, darker urine, and lighter stools, as well as eventually developing pruritus, or itchy skin, and having their skin turn yellow. If instead the tumor affects the endocrine function of the pancreas, then a new onset of diabetes in an older patient might also be a sign of pancreatic carcinoma. Laboratory findings are generally nonspecific for pancreatic carcinoma. Both serum amylase and serum lipase levels might be elevated, as well as tumor markers CA199 antigen, which is a molecule that helps with immune surveillance, and CEA, a glycoprotein involved in cell adhesion. The activation of oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes can disrupt their production, so that elevated levels appear in the bloodstream. Since these aren't specific for pancreatic carcinoma, though, they might even be elevated in patients without cancer, particularly those who smoke, and so these can't be used for diagnosis. Sometimes when there are related problems like obstructive jaundice, it might cause elevated bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase, and transaminase levels. 
Medical imaging techniques are used to confirm a diagnosis and help with staging. Stage 1 is tumors less than 2 centimeters. Stage 2 is tumors greater than 2 centimeters. Stage 3 is it can spread to neighboring tissues and organs like the duodenum in the stomach. And stage 4 is metastatic, meaning it can spread through the blood and lymph to other tissues like the liver and the lungs. Finally, imaging can also be used to help determine if it's resectable. For treatment, chemotherapy might be given as a neoadjuvant, meaning used to shrink the tumor before surgery, or as an adjuvant therapy after surgery, or to help individuals who can't have surgery at all. Unfortunately, most people with pancreatic carcinoma have a poor prognosis because it's typically pretty advanced at the time of diagnosis. Even among patients with stage one pancreatic carcinoma, the long-term survival rates are pretty low. All right, as a quick recap, pancreatic carcinoma is most commonly a cancer of the exocrine pancreas, especially in the ductal epithelial cells of the head and neck of the pancreas. And it's often caused by mutations in oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, which leads to unchecked cell growth. 